scripture is read out of respect, people rise to their feet. So if you could find Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, uh, Reverend Phillips will read that for us. Beginning in verse 16 of chapter 28, the book of Matthew reads this. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Like your pastor, I have spent the last few weeks representing American Baptists in New Jersey at a very significant missions milestone. International Ministries, known as the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society, in the year 2014, is celebrating the 200th anniversary of American Baptist Foreign Mission involvement in the world. In 1812, Ann and Adoniram Judson left the United States for India, Congregationalists at that time. And while they were in India, they met other Christians who, in dialogue, convinced them that the Baptist understanding, the New Testament understanding of water baptism and discipleship, required that as conscious believers, we go through the waters of baptism by immersion, just like we saw a few moments ago. Convicted by the Holy Spirit, Anne and Adoniram, as a couple, submitted to baptism, wrote back to the Baptist churches in America, which largely constituted those on the East Coast, including New Jersey and the Philadelphia area, and asked to be sponsored by American Baptists to be the very first North American missionaries in the world. They traveled on to Burma, now known as Myanmar, and for seven solitary and difficult years, they sought to present the gospel of Jesus to the Burmese people and associated tribes. For seven years, they labored without any visible fruit. How many of us could last seven years without any sign that God was blessing our work? They faithfully shared the gospel from village to village. In the meantime, they translated the New Testament into Burmese language for the first time in human history. And their first convert came in their eighth year of work. Two hundred years later, God has so blessed the beginning of Baptist mission involvement in the world that now there are almost one million Christians in Burma alone, and almost all of them consider themselves Baptists. When you go to Burma, as I did as a short-term missionary in 1998, wherever you go in that country, someone's going to say, the Judsons were here, the Judsons were there. There'll be a stone, there'll be a plaque, there'll be a church, there'll be a memorial saying that the Burmese Baptists have not forgotten the gift to the world that we American Baptists made by starting the missionary movement. And so this year, over 1,000 people gathered at our national camp and conference site in Green Lake, Wisconsin. And it was my privilege to work with new missionaries and our returning missionaries with over 1,000 thousand American Baptists who gathered in over 150 international leaders to celebrate, to pray, to consecrate ourselves, and 
consider what God's will is for the third century of American Baptist mission. Some seven, eight years later, and this is the story that I'm sure you all know because we're celebrating it today, God, by his Holy Spirit, called Lot Carey to be the first African-American missionary to the, con to the continent of Africa, specifically to help found the colony, then the country of Liberia. Yeah. What is not often known is two very important facts that I bring to your attention this morning. <clears throat> the first is that Lot Carey would never have gone as a missionary to Africa if it wasn't for New Jersey Baptist. That's right. Now, I can be proud of this because I was not the executive minister in 1813. <laughs> I wasn't yet born. My family wasn't yet American. But an African-American deacon by the name of William Crane moved from Newark, New Jersey to Richmond, Virginia, and he started a Bible school for slaves, and Lot Carey was one of the 20 students in it. In that school, which met three evenings every week, they learned how to read, how to write, how to do arithmetic, and how to fathom the riches and the depths of God's holy word, the Bible. And from that spiritual foundation, gained from a lay person from New Jersey. Because in the end, in every good story, it came from New Jersey. I don't know. <laughs> Some eight years later, he was called, having become self-emancipated, to do God's work and build God's kingdom in Africa. But the second fact is another one that I'm happy to celebrate this day. And that is the notion that from the very beginning of his journey, not just African Americans supported his missionary work, but through the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society, American Baptists of all races and all cultures, from the very beginning supported Lot Carey with finances, with expertise, with emotional and spiritual support and prayer. And so the story of Adam Iron and Ann Judson, Lot Carey, and American Baptists is tied together. And that is why in 2014 we celebrate no matter what our racial background may be. Amen? Amen. But let us remember that 1,760 some odd years before, the Judsons and Carey went. There was a Jewish man. I got to bring in my background somehow. You may know his name Jesus Nazareth. Born of the Virgin Mary, she was a Jewess. Her father was a guy, his father was a guy named Joseph, he was a Jew. And for his 33 years on earth, this Jewish man, a rabbi par excellence, a preacher beyond compare, because he was not only a good student of God's word, he was God's word in the heart. And died on the cross to be the Lamb of God who died for the sin of Israel, but also for the sins of all the world, our Passover land which we share in common, to provide for all of humanity an exodus from any form of bondage and slavery that might beset each and every one of us, spiritual, political, psychological, social, historical, yes. and having set his people free, yeah. he gave them a great commission. If he has set you free, it is not just to laugh. It is not just to clap. It is not just to celebrate.
but it is to embrace your great commission. Amen? amen. By the way, don't be afraid to say amen, clap, and do whatever you want. I've been in enough African American churches. I know how it works. I won't get scared and I won't run. And so, in honor of the Johnsons and Lot Cowden, in honor of the interracial support that American Baptists have always given to common mission and to the kingdom of God. I would like to take a few moments of your time this afternoon to share about how God changes everything. Do you believe God can change everything? <laughs> On the cross, Jesus changed everything. He took us from slaves to sin and gave us a freedom beyond compare. When he rose from the dead, Jesus changed everything. He made death our common enemy, a foe without any power. No matter how much tear gas it may throw at us, no matter how many bullets may come and a hope that through the Spirit can never be taken away. Amen? But before we get to that heaven, before we get to that full liberation that God has promised us, there is a great commission that Jesus did. And in that great commission, I believe God wants to change three things in each and every one of us. The first is, he wants to change how his authority operates in our history. We all have a history. We all have a story. Some of the things in our past we may be a little ashamed of. Some of them we're proud of. Some we can joke about. Some we hold dear to our heart and wouldn't share except with those who love us unreservedly. But when Jesus comes into our life, we hear what he said to the disciples as he gave them the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so I want to talk for a few moments about how Jesus' authority changes our lives. Now, Pastor, you sort of already anticipated this. <coughs> and I will say that that's the Holy Spirit between us. Come and witness. But in the 21st century, most people in North American society think authority is a four-letter word. We don't like this word obey. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. We think we are the center of the universe, and all the universe has been created for our desires, wishes, hopes, and dreams. And if God really wants the favor of our companionship, he will do whatever we tell him to do. How many of us get angry at God when we ask for something in prayer and it doesn't happen instantly? God, what's wrong with you? Don't you know how special I am? Don't you know that I'm doing the kingdom a favor by going to church? But when Jesus comes into your life for real, he turns that topsy-turvy. He turns it all over. And we recognize that we are here for him. He is the Lord and we are the disciples. We are the followers and he is the leader. We discover, much to our own surprise, that God is smarter than us, more wise than us, more mature than us. He has a longer perspective on life than we do. He actually knows something that we don't yet know. It's sort of like when you raise a child 
Any parents here today? All right. When a child is in their teenage years, they don't think their parents know anything. <laughs> but something happens, like I think it's magical after the age of 25. <laughs> Suddenly, mystically, amazingly, surprisingly, you start getting smarter in their eyes. I love it. It's so much fun. You don't even have to go back to school to get better grades in the eyes of your kids. As they mature, you become smarter in life. As we mature in Christ, we discover he's a lot smarter and wiser. So what does God want to change when we realize he is Lord and we are the followers? that he is the commissioner, and we are the workers in the kingdom. And I would like to suggest to you that this notion of authority, though it can be taken in a lot of different ways, this morning I want to take it in just one way. And that is that Jesus wants to change time. He wants to change our understanding of time. Because if he can change the way we look at time, he will change the way we act each and every day. The Great Commission is really about the timing of the kingdom of God. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the disciples gather Jesus and say, Is this the time when the kingdom will be restored? And Jesus wisely says, you don't understand anything about the timing of God's kingdom. But go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, and then you'll figure out what this time thing is all about. God wants not just an hour on Sunday morning or an extra hour on Sunday afternoon. By the way, if this was a lot of our churches, we'd be eating by now. <laughs> God doesn't want just Wednesday night. God doesn't understand our modern distinction between sacred and secular time. In fact, it's an absolute illusion that we've been holding to, which leads to all sorts of spiritual anomalies, that somehow we can praise God on Sunday and live like the devil on Monday. Church doesn't hear us when we're doing bad things the rest of the day? Are we so foolish as to think we track God in church? He never gets out into the real world and he doesn't know what we're thinking and doing? God is not content to be the God of Sunday. That was the day he was resurrected. But on Friday, he was crucified. And on Saturday, he wrestled mightily with the forces of darkness in the grave. God is a God of every day. And he wants every day to be a day in which we feel commissioned. There is an amazing photographer, the greatest photographer of the 20th century was a Frenchman named Henri Cartier-Bresson. I say that just to show I can speak French. Did you hear the accent there? He was an amazing photographer. Even if you don't know his name, you've seen his photographs. They were in the New York Times. They were in Look. They were in Life. They were in Time Magazine. They were in Vogue. They were in all the important magazines and newspapers from the 1930s to the 1970s. Today, his photographs go for tens of thousands of dollars at art auctions and are found in most of the major museums, like Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. What made Henri Cartier-Bresson such a powerful photographer was that he had a vision for what a photograph could capture, and it became known as the decisive moment. In his own words, a decisive moment captured on 35 millimeter film 
is a moment in which grace permits the photographer to capture eternity in one instant. Grace gives vision and eyes to see eternity in our world and to picture it, to capture it, to snapshot it. And every one of his pictures draws you in that way. They're ordinary scenes of ordinary people. But you can't take your eyes off of it because the picture draws you in. And through that sign value of the moment, to quote John, you see eternity snapshot still. Here's the truth. Jesus, as the Lord of time and eternity, wants to create a series of decisive moments in each and every one of your lives. It may be the baptism we just saw an hour or so ago. Is that a decisive moment in your life? If so, say amen. amen. It may have been when you said I do to that human being that you fell in love with and you still love even though their body has changed decades later. Amen. <laughs> it may be that moment when you had your first child, you look at him and her in the eye and you feel warm all over like I did when I had my son Josh and his eyes were twinkling and I realized the warmness of fatherhood that I felt was that he had peed all over my <laughs> when you said yes to be a Sunday school teacher, yes to a new job, yes to become friends with someone who didn't have anyone who could listen to them, yes to join a Sunday school class or a small group, yes to accept the call to be a pastor, yes to be a prophet to the society. In, in every one of our lives, there are planned for us decisive moments if we're only willing to be commissioned through the power of the Holy Spirit to be God's mission. Say amen? amen. The second thing that Jesus wants to change is he wants us to move from discipleship to apostleship. From discipleship to apostleship. Now when I use that term apostleship, I don't mean what it's come to mean in today's glam TV culture of Christianity. It is not getting to the hot top of the heap of church life where everyone gives you their money and you get to drive fancy cars. <laughs> in the biblical understanding, Jesus spent three years with a group of people who were called his disciples. And then, after the decisive moment of his death and resurrection, he commissioned them on Mount Tabor to then become his apostles, which simply means those who have been sent into the world to represent the king. And what I would like to suggest to you, that all discipleship activity becomes like a dead lake or pond if it doesn't have an apostolic outlook. If your discipleship journey does not lead you into mission for the sake of the kingdom on behalf of the world in the name of Jesus, no matter how much you learn in class, it will produce no eternal fruit. It will make no difference. You heard a young lady talk about what she learned in Lot Parish where she combined discipleship with mission. And I would like to suggest to you that when we do that, everything changes in our Christian outlook. Yes. My daughter, and I love to brag upon her, especially when she's not here, which is today, is 26 years old, and she's, well, the apple of my eye. She's beautiful like her mother, she's smart like her father, and she's <laughs> sassier than both of us <laughs> But she was trained as a disciple in the churches that I pastored. But then she went off to Montclair State University where your pastor was. And she 
found her voice as a Christian through into Varsity Christian Fellowship, right. where she met, as it turns out, her future husband, my, my son-in-law. It's <laughs> been two years, and I'm still finding it hard to say those words. <laughs> but it was interesting, because midway through her college experience, she felt the need to give away what she was learning from church and from InterVarsity. And so, through American Baptist missions, she spent a week and a half with some of our best missionaries in the country of Brazil and got her feet wet in cross-cultural international mission. That led to the next summer, four weeks in Hong Kong, in a Christian school teaching ESL, to Hong Kong students. And that led the next summer to an eight week stint in mainland China, <coughs> teaching in a school and witnessing in and around class in a communist country where she was being watched. And that led to a two year teaching stint, which thank God they paid her, at a Christian school in Bangkok, Thailand, we're not content to live with the other teachers in a cloister of Americans. She got out, she rented a house in a Thai neighborhood and became the talk of that part of the city. And everyone in that neighborhood took care of my little girl because she had enough courage to live with the people she said to my mom. And after two years serving God in Bangkok, God called her to use her music gifts, because she's a violinist, she's a music ed major, a teacher, and her Christian life. And she fused those two things together into a commission to one of the most exotic locales in all the globe. Not Bali, not Hawaii, but to her first choice an inner city in northern New Jersey called Passaic, where she gets to teach elementary school children their very first music lessons, and then through her character and witness and love gets to meet their families. And they all know that Miss La Mrs. Larissa is a Christian who loves them and could have taught anywhere in New Jersey. She had plenty of offers, but she willingly chose an inner city school district to bring the love of Christ to children who did not have the benefit of all the things that middle class life would do. That is mission. And so every single day, though she's not ordained, though I may just do that, <laughs> She is serving as a missionary yeah. in inner city the same. Amen. And that is what the Holy Spirit does when a person goes from being just a disciple to being a disciple who is commissioned to be apostolic. Amen? Amen. Thirdly, Jesus promises one more thing to us. And I love this verse, especially in the old King James Version. I read you international, but that's okay. In King James, it says this at the end. Jesus' last words in the gospel. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, I like that because after I became a Christian at the age of 14, where no Christian ever talked to me about Jesus at all until after I became one, three years later, I led a fellow high school student to the Lord. Her name was Lois. Little did I realize that Lois was not only going to become my very best friend, but a few years later become my wife. And on Wednesday, we will celebrate our 37th anniversary. <laughs> she loves this verse. It's one of her memory verses. Because it's one of the few scriptures where she can claim, at least in King James, yes. that Jesus is talking just to her. Low is what we call her affectionately, right? But we know it's not just a message secret to my wife, yeah. but it's a message to everyone who has ears to hear.
that Jesus is with us always, even to the very end of our commission. Now, why is this so important? Study after study in North America have pointed to a frightening epidemic that is overtaking our land and our culture, and it has been gathering steam for at least the last 40 to 50 years. I'm not talking about Ebola. I'm not talking about cancer in any of its forms. I'm not talking even about socio-political inequality or the recession that happened in 2008 or anything like that. There is actually a singular epidemic that is besetting Americans regardless of their race, their class, their culture, or the language that they speak. And it's the scourge of loneliness. <laughs> Studies have shown that in America, 25% of all adults do not have a close friend that they can share with. One out of every four of us in this sanctuary today do not have someone that we can share intimate moments with. Our hopes, our dreams, our fears, our insecurities. Oh, we say hi to each other with lots of people. We say hi to you and oh, I'm doing just fine. Praise the Lord. But the funny thing is that 25% of the people who came to church today will hear the choirs sing. They may be inspired for a few moments, but they're still going to go home lonely. They can participate in the offering. That's why most of us came, right? Amen? <laughs> and no matter how much they give, they're still going to go away without a friend to have dinner with. They can even hear the sermon. And the sermon won't cure their loneliness. They're going to leave as lonely as they came. But Jesus said, I am with you. Yes. Amen. Not just some of the time. Yes. Not just on Sunday morning. Yes. Not just when